Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the ANU and Canberra Times virtual Meet the Author tonight with Marion Wilkinson. My name is Frank Yotzo. I'm a professor here at the ANU at the ANU Crawford School of Public Policy. So before we start, I would like to acknowledge, as we do, um, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose respective traditional lands we are. Uh, in my case, here in Canberra, that's the Nunaroo people. We pay our respect to their elders past and present. Thank you very much, uh, as always, to Emeritus Fellow Colin Steele, the convener and founder of the Meet the Author series, which has been running for uh, about three decades now. Some housekeeping. This, record, uh, this event is being recorded. Um, we will have a question and answer session, so please submit your questions at any point uh, during our conversation throughout the event by clicking on the Q&A function on your screens, and we will get to questions uh, around about 6.40 or thereabouts, okay? It'd be great if you can include your name and where you are uh, with, your, with your question. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, our author for this evening, Marion Wilkinson. Good evening, Marion. Good evening, Frank. Lovely to be here. Yes, and I'm greatly looking forward to our conversation tonight. So Marion is a multi-award winning journalist with a career in radio, television, print, online. She's covered politics, national security, refugee issues, and of course, climate change. Uh, she's been a phone correspondent in Washington DC for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. She was a deputy editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, executive producer of the ABC Four Corners program, and of course, a senior reporter with Four Corners as well. Marion has won a Walkley Award, a Eureka Prize for environmental journalism, uh, and she's a member of the Australian Media Hall of Fame. Um, Marion, you've written several books, among them The Fixer on Labor's power broker, Graham Richardson, and Dark Victory uh, on Australia's response to asylum seekers, co-authored with David Marr. Now, the most recent book, and the reason we're all here tonight, of course, is the Carbon Club, an inside story of how a network of influential climate skeptics, politicians, and business leaders fought to control Australia's climate policy. That's the text on the cover. So congratulations, Marion. I'd say your book is really the definitive history of Australia's climate policy at this point. Um, and I have to say it is extremely rich in first-hand information by many uh, of the players who you've, uh, who you've interviewed. So I believe this, is, this evening is the first time you are talking publicly about the book since its release yesterday uh, or the day before. Uh, so I think we can call it the launch, the official launch of your book. So congratulations. Delighted. How does it feel to launch a book in these strange times of online gatherings? It is very strange, Frank. And I know I have lamented to you that it's so sad in a way that I can't get out into regional Australia because I think that is where this um, story needs to be told most. But anyway, it's a delight to be here and to be able to at least talk to people online and people like you who have been involved in this issue for so long, trying to work your way through our tortured climate change policy. And so I thank people like you and the other people tuning in who are at least still sticking with this idea that we do have to unravel our policy and go forward. I have a feeling we will be sticking with this perhaps for another decade or two to come. Um, Marion, let's jump straight into it. You've chronicled uh, several decades of climate change policy, the ins and outs, the political development, the uh, interest group uh, influence, all the rest of it. Um, when is the day where we, you would pinpoint that Australian climate change policy uh, and politics perhaps went off the rails? I would have to say it was the day that Malcolm Turnbull was rolled as op opposition leader back in November 2009. That event was a fascinating piece of history to unravel yet again, because we've all read the political accounts of it. We knew it was a very important time because Kevin Rudd's uh, CPRS policy, the famous carbon pollution reduction scheme, was coming up for a vote in the Senate. 
they'd done the deal, Penny Wong and, and Kevin Rudd uh, had done the deal with Malcolm Turnbull. They had really hoped this policy would go through. And when Malcolm Turnbull was rolled as opposition leader, that policy died. And a lot of people forget the day that Malcolm was rolled, that the passionate skeptics within the coalition party room and within the liberal part sorry within the liberal party room put up a resolution at the same time in the party room to basically walk away from an emissions trading scheme and that passed by a big majority and so to me that was really the day and how that day was orchestrated is laid out in the book and it's a pretty fascinating read yeah, and so this is probably important to remember, this is always the story of both major parties um, in, in Australia and occasionally um, some of the, uh, the Greens as, a, as the minor party there or, or in fact independents. But uh, let's, let's, um, let's talk through the Rudd years a little bit. So you've got uh, Kevin 07 coming into the prime ministership in part on a platform on, on strong action on climate change, which he uh, could uh, distinguish himself with, I guess, in, in comparison uh, to the then sitting Prime Minister Howard. Um, he called climate change the greatest challenge of our generation, um, got, you know, a lot of applause from world leaders and negotiators at the climate change conference in Bali, which I think you covered at the time, right? I did, yes. Um, and then within, within a relatively short period of time and a lot of domestic politics in between, um, climate change just went to one of many issues to be dealt with and perhaps rather in the too hard basket uh, for Kevin Rudd at the time. What happened? Well, a couple of really important things happened. <laughs> of course, the global financial crisis happened and that was a big problem. And, and of course, this is being reflected today when uh, now when we look at climate change again, we all have to deal with the COVID recession, essentially. But back then, that really sort of knocked the government and knocked the opposition. And very importantly for Labour, it energised quite a number of the trade unions and the union leadership who now became even more worried about the transition that they would have to go through. And it's at this time you see some of the big unions like the AWU going to what was called brown labor in the Labour caucus, the uh, parts of the Labour Party, leaders in the Labour Party like Martin Ferguson, who really supported the fossil fuel industry because of its contribution uh, to blue collar jobs they were really exercised about this and they really wanted a lot of changes to the carbon pollution reduction scheme as it was seen at the time. And they, of course, got the backing of industry. So these two big forces came together and persuaded Rudd to essentially water down quite a bit of the scheme. This caused a deep fracture with the environment groups that had backed Labour in the election. So I think what you saw was a, a, a lot of really difficult issues coming together for Rudd at the time. And essentially the business lobbies just went into overdrive, uh, trying to water down the scheme. Now, this is also always a story of strong ambition versus gradualism and incrementalism a story of um, cleanly designed economic policy uh, versus accommodating specific interest uh, pressures or addressing specific community uh, concerns. Um, I'll declare a little bit of an interest in this debate. At the time in 2008, I was one of the sort of inner circle for Professor Garno on the Garno Climate Change Review. And of course, at the time, um, Ross Garner took seriously uh, Kevin Rudd's dictum that uh, Australia should take a strong role in, in climate change. And he also, of course, took um, a, a strongly principled approach to the policy recommendations um, on, uh, on the emissions trading scheme, on Australia's emissions targets. 
um, a number of other things as well, including such things as, quite importantly, financial compensation uh, to the coal-fired power generators. And it quite, quite quickly came to, to uh, a, a rupture there between the Prime Minister and, and his, his chief climate change uh, advisor. Um, I, I love using these props. We can't usually do this, but on Zoom we can. This is a headline from December 2018 from the City Morning Herald, um, where um, the, uh, the rupture really between between Ghana or Grad uh, came came to a head. So, what what can we learn from from that period and that that turn of events? Well, that was a big rupture. The rupture between Ghana and uh, who was, of course, the Kevin Rudd's chief climate change advisor, and they had been very close. And what happened? You're absolutely right, Frank, and you were in the middle of it. The fight over the compensation for the big power generators, the coal-fired power generators that have been privatised largely in Victoria, South Australia, and uh, a few others, really broke that relationship, which took a bit of time to repair, did ultimately repair. But you've got to look, at, which I try to do in the book, at the amazing campaign that was run at the time by the power generators. I covered this at the time and I had forgotten how vitriolic it was, but you literally had some of the CEOs of the power companies and their lobbyists going around Australia and going to every backbencher in Canberra saying, you know, essentially Australia will be blacked out, Australia will be shut down, this is a disaster. And this was something, of course, that was supercharged by people in the opposition, and it was also supercharged by the Murdoch media. In the end, when Rudd first and Penny Wong did their first compromise on this, this is where the division with Ghana came, which I spell out in the book, and I did talk to Ross about it, and to Martin Parkinson, of course, who was head of the Department of Climate Change at the time. Ross came out with his famous line, which was something like, um, never has so much money been offered to so few for so little purpose in public policy. And both Penny Wong, I think, and Kevin Rudd were not very quietly furious about this. As I say, this was later repaired, but this fight over the generators um, ultimately really played in uh, also to Kevin, uh, to Malcolm Turnbull's demise, and I think was one of the big forces that ended up helping to knock off the um, Kevin Rudd scheme in the end. And I suppose we can say that time and time again, uh, the influence by strong existing economic and business influences um, has acted as a, as a break on climate change policy all along. Um, and perhaps, you know, in, in not quite so visible ways on many other areas of, of, of policy also. Um, and so, you know, I mean, we've, we've heard reports about people pointing to lists of electorates um, that that might um, you know see job losses in particular um, installations were to close as a result of policy and that essentially being used as a as a threat uh, to sitting politicians well this is to me what is so important that we learn from this story and it's one of the reasons i wrote the book this is a very powerful story in Australian politics. We know the careers of some three prime ministers were, was broken over this. And a lot of people say to me, oh, well, we know, we know that fossil fuel companies give political donations and so on. Yes, but that, that's always there. That happens all the time. It happens in a lot of areas of policy. And usually a lot of the companies give to both sides. It's not that it's unimportant. It's one factor. I think far more problematic uh, for the politicians is the way that the key lobby groups, whether it's the companies that are trying to fight the policy uh, or their political allies, have really learned to wedge individual members and 
individual areas in Australia in order to swing elections or really undermine the campaigns of the politicians. This is now down to a fine art. And when I interviewed uh, people like Greg Combe for the book, who of course was Gillard's climate change minister, he goes into this quite a bit, the way people in the Australian Coal Association would essentially just lay it out, you know, we will be campaigning, we will be campaigning in these particular seats. And I think, sadly, what both sides of politics learned and the minor parties learned is that this is a really easy issue to wedge people on. And all you have to say is that you're going to lose your job, you're going to pay higher taxes, and then this becomes a simplistic argument. And Frank, as you know, we saw it even as recently as the 2019 election. You know, if we do anything about trying to shift our, our policy on cars uh, from petrol cars, you know, you won't be able to go on the weekend. If, it, if you're a tradie, you won't be able to drive a car that will take your gear. You can see how these wedge politics have basically just now come to dominate a very toxic political debate on climate change. Yeah, and these interactions between Greg Combe and the Australian Coal Association are just one of very many episodes you have in the book. Um, where you describe these things very, very vividly, obviously on the basis of many first-hand accounts that, that you have. And I really recommend to everyone just read it in the book because Greg Combe's language here is also um, of, the, of the choicest kind, actually, in, in describing the events back then. Well, I did say to uh, Greg when I was I went back and was checking quotes with all the people I'd interviewed and I sent Greg his quotes. And I did add a little note in the email, which was to say, look, don't take out all the swearing in these quotes or no one will believe they came from you. So kindly, he did agree for the sake of authenticity to leave some of that in. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, Marion, in your book, you place quite some emphasis on the role of climate skepticism. Um, in particular, climate skeptic positions taken by people in influence in business and business lobbies as well as as politics. Let's let's talk a little bit about that um, and and your you know your your survey of the field in 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 that regard. And you know, I mean, your book mentions so many people by name. I mean, the 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 the, the register of of names, the index runs for pages and pages. Um, who should we mention? Um, Cory Bernardi, Senator <laughs> Hugh Morgan? Uh, yes, well, there are a lot of names in there. But interestingly, there was one who I think gave me a much better understanding of why the climate's skeptics were so important in this policy. And we all know, of course, that the climate skeptics have been the loud chorus in any policy debate in this country. That's a given. And we know that they, at the time, whenever there's a big climate policy was coming before the parliament, they get a lot of airplay in the Murdoch media, but frankly, also on the ABC and other places like that. But when I was interviewing a guy called Myron Ebel in Washington, he is a very prominent climate skeptic, uh, ran something called the Cooler Heads Coalition for quite some time, was at the Competitive Enterprise Institute in Washington, and he really laid out the case for me as to why it was, he felt it was so important at the time of the signing of the Kyoto Protocol, that the, the corporations that they could persuade to fund the skeptics funded them and why their arguments were so important and why it was so important to push them out, especially in Australia and the US. He said to me, if we let, what we, he claimed or he believed that the corporations and the political opponents of climate change action who didn't believe in the science had let the people who supported the scientists 
get away with murder essentially at Kyoto. And his argument was, we have to counter this because if we don't, the moral imperative to act on the science of climate change will be with those who want to take action. And he felt that if they didn't come back with a strong skeptic argument, that the essentially the conservative groups, the conservative politicians, and indeed some Labour politicians or Democrat politicians who did not want to take this action, who did not accept the science, that they would lose the moral high ground. And this was absolutely vital. And I think he was really onto something here because everyone says to you, oh, well, you know, what will Tony Abbott say to his children and grandchildren? Or what will the head of Glencore say to his children and grandchildren? If you have that science skeptic um, reassurance that this is not the serious problem people are saying it is, then you don't have to answer that moral argument. And so on the basis of those observations, would you say that um, for most of people in powerful positions like this, climate scepticism is then an instrument in order to achieve the goals? Sometimes it's definitely an instrument. Sometimes it is just that comforting background noise that goes with the debate. And one thing I found very interesting about this, uh, Frank, was that, you know, how the climate skeptics, and I know this from covering the carbon wars on the front line for Four Corners, they would come in and out of the debate. Uh, people like Bob Carter, people like Ian Plymer, a well-known Australian climate skeptics would come in and out of the debate every time pieces of legislation were before the government. I don't know if you noticed, but after the bushfires in, in the black summer that's just gone, suddenly those voices were really kicked to the curb in Australia. You, you actually didn't see them and you haven't seen them that often or nowhere near as much as you did. People and, and also the politicians who took comfort from them and, and really proselytised around them, like the Craig Kellys and that, you rarely see them, or if you do, with even people like Barnaby Joyce, who was a big supporter, and I think still is a big supporter of climate scepticism, and Matt Canavan, you don't hear them basically endorsing them and encouraging them the way you did before the bushfires. Let's come to someone who is, I think, most recently a self-described climate change agnostic, and that's uh, former Prime Minister Howard, um, and uh, his relationship with the United States. And you know, I mean, in the ebb and flow of climate change policy in, in Australia, um, the, what happens in the US, in particular the US presidency, can play uh, quite a significant role. So. Um, yeah, early, uh, early moves by, the, by uh, the, the Howard government to actually implement an emissions trading scheme back to the late 1990s. You detail these things in the book. And then a fairly, um, fairly swift and, and decisive change with a decision not to ratify uh, Kyoto uh, taken apparently, uh, according to, to your very detailed account of these things around September 11, 2001. Can you, can you tell us? Yeah, that? that was very interesting because I had been trying to pinpoint when Howard made the decision not to ratify Kyoto because, as you know, uh, the Australia and Robert Hill and his delegation did sign up for Kyoto in Kyoto. And uh, the big issue was ratifying it because unless you ratify it, as you know, it doesn't have any legal effect. So there was this tortured debate that went on for uh, quite some time after Kyoto as to whether Kyoto would be ratified. And this came to a climax in 2001. And what happened was uh, John Howard had gone to Washington 
in September 2001. And he had, uh, he had a lot of things on his plate, but principally they were trying to push ahead with the US free trade agreement. But what a lot of reporters who followed Howard to uh, Washington and covered him in Washington didn't quite pick up was that there were also background discussions going on about Kyoto. And I think it was then that Howard decided not to ratify Kyoto. There were statements he made when he came out of his meeting with Bush that to me really indicates it was at that time he really wanted to, to break and finally break and say, let's not ratify Kyoto. What happened, of course, was the day after those meetings, September 11 happened. And the whole issue of climate change in Kyoto was swept from the agenda. There was an election here back in Australia shortly afterwards. And Robert Hill, the environment minister that had really hung in there on Kyoto, he was moved to defence. A new minister, David Kemp, came in, who himself was was sceptical of some of the signs of global warming. I would say he's a, he was a sceptic. He, he kind of quibbles with that. But nevertheless, there was still a push to ratify Kyoto. I think Howard had already made his decision and then finally made it in this incredibly embarrassing way for his minister. His minister was in Bali at a World Environment Day function. Howard got up in the parliament and basically said, we're not going to ratify it. And as, um, as Kemp admitted to me, that was a captain's call by uh, Howard. And that's laid out in the book. And I thought one of the most interesting things that was said to me by Robert Hill, Howard's old minister, was I think the fundamental reason uh, Howard did not want to ratify Kyoto was his loyalty to Bush. And I think there's a lot in that. Mm. Which takes us to the question, speculating if we saw Biden presidency in the US early next year, uh, a different wind would of course also be blowing across uh, the Pacific to Canberra. How would you expect that uh, that might play out? I think that is going to be very interesting for Australia. Uh, Biden, as you know, has uh, already made some key statements on the climate change policy. The Democrats are very committed to it. John Kerry, who obviously had worked with Obama on the lead up to Paris, he's been advising uh, Obama, but others have as well, you know, like uh, people like um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Ocasio who's sort of quite radical on this. She has been on the advisory team as well. I think that, you know, Biden, uh, Biden's team at least, uh, his advisors are talking about carbon tariffs. They are talking about a faster transition away from coal and gas. That I think will put Australia in a very di difficult position if Biden gets in, a little bit how the Abbott government was with Obama. But of course, the polls are narrowing now in America. And if, on the other hand, Trump is returned to the White House, I think no one has any doubt that the Paris Agreement will struggle uh, to, to essentially remain effective in any way at all. Let's take a minute uh, to talk about the Abbott-Obama uh, relationship. Must must have been um, pretty pretty tortuous in, in some way, in particular uh, on, on climate change. Um, both the fact that, you know, the, the Abbott government, of course, was the one that um, submitted Australia's pledge and commitment to the Paris Agreement um, and ratified the Paris Agreement. Um, and then also uh, a certain episode with uh, Obama's visit to Australia. Yeah, well, the, of course, the Obama vis visit to Australia came before the Paris Agreement, but straight after Obama had struck the famous deal in Beijing with President Xi to bring the uh, Chinese on board to try and get a Paris Agreement. 
this of course had been born out of the terrible what was seen as the terrible failure of Copenhagen and more importantly the humiliation of the uh, Americans by the Chinese delegation at, at Copenhagen and no one wanted this repeated this deal was struck and then just days after that Obama was flying to Australia for the G20 and as his advisors told me, Obama's advisors told me, they really needed climate change to be on the agenda. And as one of Abbott's advisors told me, they really did not want climate change on the agenda. And so this became a behind the scenes clash that started uh, really before, a bit, you know, months before. And in the book, I talk about Podesta, who was then John Podesta, then one of Obama's senior White House advisors, telling me that uh, in his view, Abbott was the Donald Trump of his times and that Abbott's team was definitely, as they saw it, as he put it, rowing in the wrong direction. Anyway, this did become uh, a real source of tension here. And I talk about how this played out once Obama got to Australia. What happened, though, of course, was that what you're dead right, um, Abbott was the one who finally did agree a target with Greg Hunt and Julie Bishop in cabinet. That was the target taken to Paris. But by the time the Paris uh, uh, meeting happened, Abbott had been rolled, Turnbull was in, and Turnbull was able to go and make his, you know, very uh, passionate speech to the um, to the Paris summit. The only trouble is when when Malcolm got home, he couldn't really do anything much about Abbott's climate change policy because he didn't have the numbers really in the party room. So Malcolm was Malcolm Turnbull was actually stuck with Abbott's policy. Yeah, so so Malcolm Turnbull and the whole um, saga of the the National Energy Guarantee the neg. Um, and what, what would you say does that uh, tell us? I mean, you know, in a sense, um, the, the debate in the headlines of, of Australian politics on climate change was always one about mechanisms. It was about the carbon tax, about the emissions trading scheme, about compensation. And then it was, in the end, under Turnbull, um, on a really quite arcane, highly technically complex specific mechanism that would have applied only to electricity generators and retailers. Um, and yet it was a thing that got his prime ministership undone, at least ostensibly. So what, what can we say about the, the weaponization of energy and climate change policy? Well, I think the NEG says it all because there were a whole lot, well, not a whole, there was a, a one key reason why some people in the party room wanted Malcolm to go and uh, Malcolm Turnbull to go. And that reason was they didn't think he'd win the next election. But the weapon that was chosen to be used was climate and energy policy. And for me, that really is the ultimate um, climax of this saga, that something as important as climate and energy becomes the ultimate internal party wedge to bring down a leader. Uh, so it's no longer what uh, really matters in the science, in the issue of the just transition about how we go about becoming a different economy. It's just become a political weapon. And I think I, I had spoken to Malcolm Turnbull quite soon after he lost office. And again, it was like sitting opposite Kevin Rudd or Penny Wong or Greg Combay uh, or so many of the scientists, businessmen, uh, business women who I had interviewed who've been on the other end of the battle over climate change policy. Everyone shell-shocked and shell-shocked that in this country, you cannot get up a policy that doesn't become a toxic political battlefield. Now, the one prime minister who we haven't yet talked about in depth of the, of the past prime ministers who were grappling with this, this issue is, of course, Julia Gillard. 
Um, and really, that was the high watermark in terms of actual implementation of climate change policy mechanisms in Australia. Australia, in fact, the only major country in the world that um, implemented a comprehensive well-designed carbon pricing mechanism and then abolished it again. Um, and that indeed happened under, under a minority government. Um, and it involved a particular institution, a multi-party committee on climate change. Mayan, would you say there's anything that can, that can still be learned from, from those years of government? I think there's two things for me that come out of the period of the Gillard government. You're exactly right, of course, that this was a policy of a minority Labour government backed by the Greens and independents. This was, I think, in part why their reaction to it by the Conservative parties was as brutal, really, as it was. And I think if you're looking for the, for the um, most brutal period of politics over climate change in Australia, it is definitely Julia Gillard's period. And I covered it at the time, but going back over it, man, I was, I was really still shocked about how brutal it was, especially all the ancillary people, you know, the death threats and the um, abuse. And I mean, this was going on on both sides, you know, it wasn't just one side, but it was a horrible period in Australian pro politics. And um, yet, and yet, as you say, there were some very interesting things that came out of that period, because in part, I think, Labor had to go into a multi-party uh, sort of situation uh, to get its policy through the parliament. And so you ended up with these very innovative uh, institutions like that we still have today, like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, like the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, like the um, Climate Change Authority, these ones that have survived, even though I think that they've been, you know, they have been, you know, slapped around a bit on the way. But I think that there was a, a sense here that you could do something. And also don't forget before uh, Gillard came in, Rudd had, had managed to get the increase in the renewable energy target. All these policies together, you see when uh, Labor finally falls in 2013 and the as one of the Labour ministers put it to me, the Lord of the Flies feeding frenzy over climate change really just settled on the country. Uh, but before everything was uh, pretty much then overturned or Abbott attempted to overturn it, it was having an impact on Australian emissions. And that is the interesting thing. Mm. That's right. Um, we've got a great many uh, questions coming in. We'll come to them in just one minute. Um, I'd just like to ask you one more question of, of my own, and that is, Marion, how, how do you see um, the two major parties positioning on, on this issue? Now, before the time when, when COVID is no longer the single, the pretty much the single thing that, that occupies the political uh, space, how do you see Labour positioning? How do you see some of the, uh, the liberal uh, party politicians who are on the record as wanting, um, you know, forward-looking climate change policy. How, how do you see people positioning? That is a hard one, harder than you think, I guess, to speculate on, because if you just look at what uh, the federal minister, Angus Taylor, is saying, what uh, Scott Morrison is saying, one would imagine that there is a fairly clear line ahead for the government, which is uh, gas playing a central role uh, in the future as, the, uh, as basically a supporter of the manufacturing industry here as a, as a key player in the transition supposedly between renewables, uh, between coal-fired power and renewables and a determination not to have serious carbon pricing in this country. As 
uh, Angus Taylor keeps on telling us, you know, technology, not taxes, that this will be solved by a, a technology roadmap and not by carbon pricing. When he says taxes, he, he's really saying no carbon pricing. So at that, at that level, you, you would think uh, we are essentially saying we are going to stick to the path that Australia has largely tried to stick to, apart from various aberrations when people like Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard come along. On the other hand, I think in New South Wales in particular, but also in South Australia, uh, there is a, a big push in the, in the state Liberal parties uh, to move faster towards renewable energy. And that is going to create some tensions, I think, between those states and Canberra. Labor, I think, is in a very difficult position. I have no doubt that they are still shell-shocked by what happened in the 2019 election. I wouldn't say that carbon, their, carbon, uh, their climate change policy lost them that election, but I think it had a huge impact in what happened in Queensland, especially those Queensland region, regional seats. I think that there, there are serious divisions in the party. I think you just have to look at the AWU, who've come out really strongly to back the gas-led recovery. And I think this is all very difficult for the Labor Party. And I think their position is going to be kind of tortured over the lead up to the next election as to what they can actually do. Let's come to some of the questions. Um, we've had some pre-submitted questions. One is from Annette. Um, the question is, there has been an initial hope that COVID-19 would be an opportunity to invest in a greener economy, or has the economic recession increased the power of the carbon club? What would you say? Well, that's uh, kind of what we've just been discussing. Yes, you're absolutely right. In Europe, there has been uh, a big push uh, to have a, an, a recovery that basically helps push the, uh, the world along to a cleaner energy outcome. And uh, I think Sir Nicholas Stern put it very well that we don't want to go from the COVID frying pan into the climate fire. I think this is certainly the view, as we discussed, of Biden and a lot of his advisers. The question is, if, uh, there, if Trump does return in November to the White House, I think that will really lessen the appetite uh, in, uh, in Australia to move very quickly. It, I think, might also lessen the appetite in Japan and certainly in China which really, really matters on this. On the other hand, you are seeing countries like India, as well as the Europeans, trying to shift uh, and shift fairly quickly. So it's, it's a bit hard to say. I think the issue for Australia though, right now, in this recovery, in the post-COVID recovery, is are we going to invest a lot in gas. Is this real? Are the propositions being put up by the COVID Recovery Commission, by Morrison, by Angus Taylor for this gas-led recovery, is it real or is it just really to protect a few projects like Narrabri that people want to get off the ground? I am not completely certain about that. The government must know that investors, uh, that insurers, that banks will be shying away for the, from the kind of investment I think that's being envisaged by some people in this gas-led recovery. And I may take the opportunity to highlight that, you know, the ANU and other universities have, of course, you know, done analysis, research on, you know, what kind of economic recovery spending makes most sense. And it really comes back based on a big body of global evidence from the global financial crisis and, and other work, it comes back to some real basics, right? Are you creating jobs? Are you creating jobs for the right people um, with the right type of skills in the right regions? 
Um, and, you know, are you getting bang for buck and are you creating value for the long term? And that value can be social, it can be environmental as well, it, and it can, be, can, can uh, consist of, of a low carbon future. So, yeah, and I think, you know, and fundamentally, you raised this before, Frank, we always talk about mechanisms, but at the end of the day, are we going to defeat the science of climate change? If we actually do believe in the science of climate change, there is a limit, as we all know, there is a carbon, carbon budget limit. And over the last two decades, each time we've had to make a really big decision on this, Australians seem to fall back on the fact that we can bet against the science actually, you know, being, being the critical issue. And I think in this decade, we're getting to the point where it's going to be harder and harder to bet against the science. We have a question from Scott, um, and the question is roughly, um, how, how can we educate Australians to bring serious wide-scale action onto a political agenda, not only to turn the ship, but to catch up on the last 20 years? And so I guess the wider, that, that raises a wider question that we haven't talked about much, and that is public attitudes and perceptions, um, you know, which ultimately should drive political decisions in, in a democracy. So um, what, what uh, have you observed in terms of how public perceptions shape politicians' attitudes based on your work? Well, what I have found interesting uh, in doing this book is that whenever I uh, talked to people or interviewed people uh, about the book and said what I was doing, they were saying, oh, thank God, I want to find out, you know, Australians by and large support climate policy. Why hasn't this happened? And I think one of the issues is that climate change has not actually been put at the center of debate. It's been put on the sidelines of the debate. And fundamentally, I think that has to change, not only just within the government, although that's the most important area, but you know, in business, in education, in uh, communities, because ultimately, again, if we do believe the science, climate change is going to influence so many factors uh, of our lives from agriculture to um, the, how we build our buildings, where we build them, we know all this stuff. But you know, the thing that really shocked me was, um, I think it was about six weeks ago, maybe eight weeks ago now, when the, um, the white paper discussion, uh, the white uh, paper uh, defense, oh, white paper dis uh, discussion paper came down. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I know there's, you know, obviously we're repositioning over China, but I read through it, thought I must have missed something, did a search of it, there is one mention of climate change in that entire discussion paper. And I thought, seriously, do we really think that reviewing what is going to be our forward-looking defence policy, that climate change is not a key issue here? And, I, and then I, you know, of course, we come back to the obvious in agricultural policy, in education policy, in building, po in all these things, we have to move, if we believe in this, that the science is real, we have to move the issue into the centre of our policy thinking, not as a side order issue. Um, I'll take two questions together here. One is from Pamela, what tactics are most effective in opposing um, the carbon club tactics. And I suppose you could ask, you know, for a politician, um, how, how do you deal with, um, with, with the lobbying pressure, essentially? And, and a question from Jim, if you had to name one person responsible for Australia's lack of action on climate change, who would you name? I think the last one is, I can't, I, I really can't because you know, you could certainly, there's plenty of people in the book who argue and have been very effective in arguing against climate change policy and lobbying against it. And, uh, you know, 
Hugh Morgan would have to be one of the key figures in this. I think he is a sort of central, centrally influential pe person in the Liberal Party, at least up until, you know, the, um, uh, the end of the uh, Howard period and also for quite a bit of the Rudd period as well. But one could equally argue why didn't Rudd crash? Why didn't Kevin Rudd crash through on his policy? Why didn't the you know Greens vote with Labor on its policy? You can you can pick off individual debates, but essentially there are too many factors influencing those debates. And I think one of the one of the things I would say about what you do about this lobbying is is to repeat what people like Ross Garno and Bernie Fraser, who was head of the Climate Change Authority, a long time Canberra bureaucrat says, um, is that you actually stand up against it if you're a politician, you try to argue the policy position and the public position, and you do that in a way where you don't duck the hard debate. I think one of the things that really undermined Shorten, uh, Bill Shorten in the last election, was he was perceived by the public as ducking the debate on climate change. People will lose their jobs. You have to work out what is going to happen to those jobs. It's not an easy thing to do. Australia, and this comes through uh, again and again in the book, and it came through with every paper I read on this when I was researching the book, that old dichotomy, Australia was one of the developed countries that has profited the most from the free flow of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Our wealth, our way of life has profited from that for decades. We are also one of the developed countries most affected by climate change because of our dry uh, climate, because of our propensity for drought, for bushfires, to, to, uh, because our, our cities and towns are built on the coast. We have a lot to lose. And so we are really, as, as your old boss, Ross Garno said, we're in the, one of the worst positions, in a sense, uh, in this debate. But it also means we have to have those tough arguments and we have to argue and put these positions honestly. You can't just pretend that the, either we can stay where we are, relying on coal-fired power, the world won't let us do that, and we also can't pretend that this is an easy transition for us. And certainly what needs to be said is that uh, increasingly this tough choice is looking brighter for Australia because the, uh, the fundamental uh, cost factors in energy are changing and are changing rapidly in favour of clean energy and in a low carbon world. Um, Australia no longer looks like an economic loser, but like an economic powerhouse based on a renewable energy advantage. And so me personally, I would say that is the great hope for Australian climate change policy in coming decades. Simply the fact that economic advantage, long term economic advantage for our country will more and more align with strong climate change action. And so that, um, you know, this, this grand clash of two objectives that you described will become less of a feature in, in the future. And that's what keeps me hopeful. And I think what is fascinating, Frank, when you go over, back over all these policy debates back to Howard's time and Kevin Rudd's time, what's really interesting is reading back over the inputs by people like the Business Council of Australia and various big business lobby groups. As they go about trying to uh, fashion the policy, to change the policy, to undermine the policy sometimes, the, the lack of understanding that renewable energy in its various forms will ultimately be economically successful. 
really crosses their mind. And that's, I think, one of the powerful things about looking back at these debates. You see how wrong the, um, the decisions were of people who were trying to pick winners. Renewable energy was always, as uh, one of the people I spoke to put it, they were always the Cinderella in the corner. Renewables were, you know, just at a small issue that would never really make much of an impact on Australia. And if you think people thought like that even a decade ago, and what is going on in Australia now, let alone the rest of the world, um, is uh, it, it just puts a lie to that. And it's it's interesting how really clever people got that wrong. We're rapidly running out of time. We've got about 10, 11 unanswered questions and please accept my apologies for my poor timekeeping that we can't come to them in the discussion. However, Marion will be able to see them um, on the chat. So the questions cover a wide range of questions such as, uh, you know, the question about the, uh, the wisdom of a gas-led recovery. Uh, can Australia take once again a leadership position internationally on climate change? What about the influence of uh, Pacific Island countries um, in, on, on Australia's uh, strategy uh, and, and many more. Um, perhaps we'll, we'll, um, we'll conclude on, on just one question and that's posed by John Morrison here. Um, so John is asking, uh, how much of the hostility to climate change action um, on the right of the political spectrum do you think was driven by genuine ideology and how much was political opportunism? Um, and in that respect also, um, where does the, uh, the Murdoch media currently sit on this question? I think, I think that's a, both of those are very good questions. And the first one, I think it was always a mixture of uh, ideological belief and political opportunism. I interviewed one of uh, Malcolm Turnbull's allies in those awful uh, days after the brawling over the neg when you know people and once again whole lives were shattered over those awful kind of debates uh, not the least of course being Turnbull's but I asked him uh, I asked this ally of Turnbull's how many people still in the cabinet and in the party room a coalition party room are climate skeptics and this guy said, well, probably a third of the cabinet, probably a third of the coalition party room. But it depends what you mean by skeptics. He said there's the skeptics in that they don't believe, they sincerely do not believe the, climate, the science of climate change. He said, and then there's the skeptics in that we can use this to fight the Labour Party so it's stupid for us to do anything in this space that takes away from that fight because this is red meat for our base. And that was his words. And I think that really tells you, again, you know, that political opportunism plays a big, big uh, part in all this. On the Murdoch media, I think Clearly, the Murdoch media have been very influential in this debate. Um, I, uh, I have a number of friends and I'm a great admirer of some reporters uh, who work for the, for the Murdoch media, but it's foolish to say they haven't been a big part of this debate. You talk to any politician who's ever been involved in this and they regale you with the stories of being, you, you know, uh, sort of uh, on, on edge every day that a policy is going through on climate change. And we, we only, I think, have to look at the words of James Murdoch when he was splitting with the company recently, where his spokesperson said that James Murdoch and his wife, uh, one of their profound disagreements uh, with the family at the moment, in the wake, especially in the wake of the Australian bushfires, 
was their reporting of uh, climate uh, in their media. So yes, I, I think they're definitely a factor. But again, since the bushfires, I would have to say there is a lot less of, of the uh, some of the reporting that we'd seen in the past. But of course, uh, there is still quite a bit of it left. Yeah. And, you know, that is, I guess, their prerogative. And as long as they own those newspapers, I think that's what they'll be doing. Marion, thank you very much for spending this hour with us. Thank you for your insights. And indeed, thank you for writing this book. Mm, I think it's an important public service, actually. So uh, great to have you with us and uh, good luck with the rest of the activities promoting the book. Thank you so much, Frank, and thanks so much to the ANU and to Colin Steele for this opportunity and for everyone that's um, paid me the courtesy of listening and joining this debate. Uh, I really um, very uh, feel very fortunate to, to have your company tonight. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, thank you to everyone who tuned in uh, and thank you to everyone who's uh, watching and listening later on uh, online and keep your eyes peeled for uh, the next episode of Meet the Author. Thank you and good night. <laughs>